My name is Christine Anthony. I'm going to caveat, I am a parent of a freshman and I'm going to be doing my best not to be an embarrassing parent. She is not in this classroom, but you know, I will caveat that. And what I think is cool about today is when my kids were growing up, one of the best things I loved doing was coming into the classroom during March's reading month and reading them a story. Now, obviously, as kids grow up, they get kind of old for their parents to read them a story. So today is fun because I am able to tell you a story that I hope you will enjoy. So as all stories, once upon a time, there was a beautiful baby girl born. She was perfect in her parents' eyes in every single way. Ten fingers, ten toes, and she even had a superpower. She could make people fly because everyone told her dad that he floated across the tennis courts when she was born. So that sounds like a really cool baby. And she grew up and had a happy family, and everything was really good. She even got a little sister to love slash hate. But then, it wasn't. See, this little girl, as she was growing up, everything seemed fine. She actually was quite precocious in learning how to speak. Most babies don't start speaking sentences until they're almost two. This girl was speaking full sentences by the time she was 11 months old. Her mother would say one of her favorite things to say, because obviously daddy loved tennis, daddy, go pay tennis. But somewhere around the year, two years old, her parents started to notice something. She stopped talking. At first they were like, eh, it's just a little quirk. You know, maybe she's going through a phase. And then, you know, they were busy with a new baby, and as a parent, you kind of get overwhelmed. And then they were like, hmm, we think something really is possibly wrong. But they didn't know what. And they didn't know what to do, because otherwise she seemed perfectly happy. And it wasn't until she was almost three that someone in a childcare setting suggested, have you ever had her hearing tested? And lo and behold, indeed, that little girl had profound bilateral hearing loss, meaning as bad as it can get in both ears. And like most parents, when something doesn't go right with your, parent, your child, you cry. So they got the tears out of the way, and how can we help her? So they got her hearing aids right from the get-go. And the hearing aids were actually pretty cool because she started talking again. And she started saying things like, the bird sing, the grocery store play music. How cool. But they also knew that despite the hearing aid helping, she was going to be facing significant challenges, both in communication and in education. So they enrolled her into a preschool for deaf children, which was a pretty happy place for her. And I'm going to take a little sidestep and point out for those of you guys how far technology has come. We're all familiar with the little hearing aid behind the ear. But this young man and the young boy in the front, this is an actual hearing aid as it was way back in the good old days where you wore this big thing on your chest and had wires on your ears and today would probably look like a phone listening to music. And that's how kids, so this little girl in the center. But her teachers kept saying she's doing so well, she has such great academic accomplishments, she's on par and everywhere. We think she could be mainstreamed. So her parents had to make choices what to do. And they took that leap of faith and enrolled her in kindergarten in public school. And she became the first deaf child mainstreamed in a public school in Genesee County, which is the county right above us. And with her family support and her amazing teacher support, teachers are key. So in every day, you feel like your teacher's just awful, please, they're trying. And those teachers are responsible for making a difference in a lot of kids' lives. And they made a difference with the community. This little girl thrived.
but it wasn't without a lot of challenges. The first being social isolation. Being a guinea pig, it kind of sucks. Being different and nobody's understanding. She came home from school many days, absolutely sobbing her heart out. No one will play with me. No one will let me play with them at recess. And it was so heartbreaking. They're making fun of me because of the way I talk. And it got so bad that her little sister, who was probably six or seven, started going around threatening to beat up anyone that bothered her big sister. Cultural ignorance. So it's really important for people to have a taste in music and television and movies and just cultural icons. But this little girl, because there were no captions on television, she had no idea the bar where everyone knows your name, or about Ross and Rachel, or about anything like Madonna. She had heard of Madonna, but she had no idea what a Madonna was. She didn't watch movies. So Netflix was probably a really good thing in adulthood to catch up on all those movies. And it's sort of isolating. One experience she had at a summer camp is they were putting on a skit to Material Girl. This girl was probably eight or nine years old. And she's like, I don't even know what Madonna is. And you can imagine everyone at camp probably thought she was pretty weird. Insecurity. Nobody wants to be the odd man out. We spend our whole time trying to be cool and fitting in, but yet having our own unique brand. But it's hard to fit in when you have no choice and you obviously stand out. So what this little girl did, unfortunately, was push back. I'm not deaf. I have my hair covering everything so nobody can notice anything. And when the teachers try to offer me things such as amplifiers in the classroom, uh-uh, not doing it, not doing it. I don't want to look weird. And this actually continued all the way up into college where this girl made the mistake of refusing everything to help in the college, note takers, anything, and came home with some pretty bad grades her first year. And keep in mind, this was also back in a time, because she was the first to be mainstream, no one had figured out things like interpreters, note takers, and general support. So this girl was doing all of this, choosing to do it alone, with only her parents and her teachers helping her. Medical instability. So when you have something that's relatively new and no one knows why this child has hearing loss, and the fact that the hearing loss was very fluctuating, some days she would show up, hi, I know who you are, I can hear you. And the next day, for the next six months, she can't hear a thing, and no one could figure out why. So she would be in the classroom, completely in a world of silence. When there were well-meaning interventions, and by age nine, She'd actually had about six or seven surgeries on her ears just to try to figure out what's going on. But she managed to thrive. She managed to get through high school where, you know, awkward freshman where you guys are today and turned herself into an amazing young adult. She graduated high school with honors she went off to college at Michigan where she studied computer engineering and she traveled the world and saw all these amazing things in Europe and she did pretty well to herself. Eventually down the road, she met someone and fell in love and got married, decided to go to grad school where she got her MBA at Northwestern University in Chicago and she started a family walked away from corporate America and started her own business. So this little girl's done pretty good in life. If you haven't guessed by now, I don't think I notice anybody sleeping. You've probably figured out this was the story of my childhood growing up. I didn't want to tell this story to get 
pity party or, oh, that's amazing, or accolades, or have any kind of remark. Instead, I wanted to tell this to show it. Everyone here has what I like to call quirks. Some of these quirks are obvious, like a physical quirk. Can't walk right, can't hear right, can't see right. Some of them are mental quirks. We have trouble reading, we have trouble figuring out math, we have trouble paying attention. Some are cultural quirks. We have families that don't fit in sometimes and have different traditions. We have home life quirks. All of us have something that makes us different. All of us have challenges in our life. And so I wanted to tell you about a few things that were the key to making myself overcome all those challenges. The first one is no limits, no excuses. There is nothing none of you can do. The only thing that would stop you is the price tag. Every goal has a price tag and only you can decide if you are willing to pay that price tag for a goal. In my case, I would have to get around a lot of obstacles. There would be a bumpy road. You have to take some detours. But those price tags, I was willing to go to an amazing college, to go to an amazing grad school, to just live in mainstream America despite having hearing disadvantages. Sometimes you might say a goal, let's say you want to be a professional athlete. You're really into your sport. Are you willing to pay the price tag of dedicating every single second that you have to that sport? No going out with friends, no having fun on any other thing, possibly moving away from friends and family to get to that elite level. Some people are willing to do that, and they do. Others, that price tag's too high. So think about your goals and your price tag. And for me, that's what it kept in mind and what I was willing to pay. Aim high and advocate for yourself. Going along with those goals, don't set the bar lower. We as a society tend to say, oh, poor you, you're wearing red shirts. I got to give you a break today because I think of Ohio State when I think of red shirts, so I'm going to assume that your brain cells are broken, right? So I'm going to lower my expectation. Poor you, you can't see. I'm going to say you can't learn to read as well. Don't lower that bar. And that was a gift my parents gave me. They said the expectation for me were exactly the same as the expectation to my little sister who had normal hearing. I was expected to get the same grades, high grades. I was expected to do the best I could and excel to the best I could in any sport. I was expected to do everything that any statistically normal child was expected to do. And then advocating for yourself. Right now, you guys are in a bit of a bubble. You get the support. If you have challenges in school, the school supports you. Your parents support you. But let me tell you this. Once you get out into that real world out there, nobody cares, nobody supports you unless you ask for it. You have to tell people that you need help. You have to tell people you're facing challenges. And you have to organize your life to succeed because no one's going to do it for you. So make sure you get in the case of advocating. As a parent myself, I don't want anything to happen to my kids. I want them to have smooth sailing. And it's hard to let them fail and have challenges. But the more you can fail and have challenges now while you have backup, the better you'll be set up to succeed. The last key to success, I think is the most important, is finding your tribe. We all go around trying to please the world so that people will like us. Well, guess what? 100% fact, universal likeness is not possible. Mother Teresa had people that hated her. I'm pretty sure. So instead of putting that energy into making others like you, find your tribe. Find people that accept you as you are, and you don't have to change yourself for them. And that will be your happy place. I found this in two ways. In high school, I found it through sports. You have a lot of opportunities in high school for schools, clubs, clubs, sports, other activities, and find people that like you. I happen to be pretty good at running. I also did track and I did ski racing. 
And I found out by joining those team, people appreciated me for what I could do for the team. I could run well. And they didn't care the fact that I had hearing loss or I had quirky speech or I had any of these different. They cared that I was in a team and no one messes with the team. The other one was a really hard lesson I had to learn as an adult. If you remember what I said earlier, I refused a lot of help. Got myself in trouble my freshman year in college because when you're in a 500 person lecture, it's kind of hard to hear the professor. So having a note taker, really good idea. I refused a lot of help because I didn't want to seem weak or weird or stand out. And then it happened the first year I was working, I was away at a conference and on the bus, I happened to meet a remarkable young man whom I'm still friends with today. He had hearing aids just like me. He was using spoken language and working at the same company and working in mainstream America just like me. And boy, did he have a lot of words for me. You need to get your life in order. You need to talk to your employer. You need to be upfront. You need to stop being ashamed of yourself. And to me, it was just so awe-inspiring to meet someone like me and then being told I'm a moron for refusing all the possibilities out there. And I am forever grateful for what he did because that day forward, I stopped being ashamed. I stopped hiding. And I met my tribe. This young man introduced me to a large group of people. There's about 100 or so of us all over the country. We have a Facebook group, and every couple of years we meet in a place. Before the pandemic, we all met for a big weekend in Seattle. Every single one of us are people in mainstream America. Doctors, lawyers, dentists, advocates, writers, you name it. They all have hearing loss. They all speak. They all interact mainly with hearing people. And when you find that tribe, it's heaven. It's really like, I belong. I'm loved for me, not anything else. So find that tribe. And I promise you, once you find that tribe, you really, it, it'll be utopia. So enough about me. I wanted to also turn this into things that you can take with you. And I have a couple of pieces of life, of advice, if you will that hopefully if you go out there and practice these things, you can make a difference in not only your life, but others' lives. Number one, I know you've heard it, I'm gonna repeat it again, be kind, be respectful. Going out and smiling at someone. Hi, how you doing today? Yeah. What did she do? She smiled back, and I'm guessing for about one second, you had a little warm and fuzzy, right? right? That smile makes people feel good. Now, are you and I bound together? Do we have to go and hang out together every day? No. We probably won't talk to each other all year again, right? But for that one second, I made a positive impact on your life, and you probably feel good about it for one second before you forget about it. If everyone goes around just being kind, no matter how weird, no matter how, you know, I don't want to be associated with that person. You don't have to be associated with that person to smile and be kind. There are some pretty awful people out there that have made really bad choices in this world. Adolf Hitler, for one. More recently, the Oxford shooter last uh, fall. What if someone had taken a few minutes before they made those poor choices and was a little bit kind. Maybe these individuals would have made different choices. We don't know, but you can't go wrong with being kind. Being perceptive. How we see ourselves is a lot harsher than how others see us. And it also can be how you think people judge you and they're not. So be aware of your self-perception and be aware what the reality is that everybody's seeing you. I'm gonna give a great example. I've experienced it in my life and I'm pretty sure every single person in this classroom has experienced it. How many of you have been called on in class and you don't know the answer, you're not prepared, and you feel like an absolute idiot? I challenge anybody not to raise their hand. Yeah. And what do you guys think 
Oh my God, I'm a moron. Everybody's laughing at me. Everybody thinks I'm the stupidest person ever. Everybody knows I didn't do my homework properly. What do you think all of those people around you are really thinking? Thank God the teacher didn't call on me. I promise you, you're judging yourself and really everybody else is going, thank God it's not me. The other perception insight I had was a few years after I graduated high school, my sister happened to be hanging out at a bar with some high school classmates of mine. And somehow the topic of my deafness came up. And they told my sister, I had no idea she was deaf. I actually thought she was a stuck up snob because I would say hello to her in the hallway and she would completely ignore me. Imagine my jaw dropping like, Oh my God, I thought people just didn't like me. They never talked to me. But they had the perception that I was a snob and I had the perception that they just didn't like me. And those perceptions didn't overlap. So really try to think about if you have someone out there that's just acting really weird or just different, maybe find out why. The last two I have to passing it forward is ask questions. We unfortunately as a society are told, don't stare at the person with the white shoes, that's rude. Don't stare at somebody that like under armor, that's horrible. Keep it to ourselves, keep away. But the opposite is actually true. We all like to feel like we matter. So if I'm gonna ask, it sounds like you like sports, right? Yes, you got a big Bloomfield shirt. What sport are you playing? I'm playing baseball. Baseball, awesome. I think I saw another baseball shirt. Are you a baseball player? Now you guys probably feel good about that. I asked questions. I said, you matter. You're relevant. Don't be afraid to ask the question in a very respectful way. Ask them, why are you in the wheelchair? Sometimes those two and three year olds that do that have it right. So asking the question lets us take it from weird to human and we see people as they are. And my last one is see the real person. Social media, then it's a mess out there. We gotta love it, but we gotta hate it. And we don't know what's real. And until you ask those questions, we're not seeing what's real. Because I promise you, everything out there that is a public face isn't real. It's a public face. And you need to ask the question to get what is real. You've all seen those Instagram filters. The lady on the right is perfectly lovely. Nothing wrong with her, but somehow she feels the need to present as a redhead. This is an example from my own Facebook posting. Normally most of us will post the one on the top, right? Happy smiling family. I will guarantee you 90% of the time the one on the bottom more real. Boys yelling at each other, girl yelling at each other, mom and dad fighting. Normal, happy family, but would I ever post that on Facebook? So ask those questions to find the real person. Everyone has problems, everyone has challenges, and if we can all see each other as human, then you can make a lot of difference. There were people that cared about me, the teachers, and making my journey come to success because they saw me as a person, not as weird. They saw me as someone that could succeed. And if you can see the potential in others, you can help others succeed. And then on the question vein, anybody that is brave enough to ask questions, I'm opening myself up to that vulnerability. Yes? Did you ever learn how to speak ASL? That's a great question, and yes, one of the things my parents did when I was five, you know, identified five years old, they stuck me in sign language lessons. And I actually got pretty proficient at sign language. But guess what, they never learned sign language. I went to a hearing school, no one around me signed. So my signing skills, once I stopped taking lessons, went to what most of you will have in your high school Spanish five years after you finish it and you don't speak Spanish. You're not very good at it. So signing is great, it's actually easier, it's less tiring, but you gotta use it to use it or lose it. Yes? Um, did you ever learn how to 
you ever find out why your hearing is fluctuating when you're younger? Yes, um, I have, thanks to 23andMe, you know, that's kind of cool if you're into genetic. We found out that I have something that's called Pendrit syndrome. It's actually genetic. I got two crappy genes from my parents, and it just got triggered where they triggered progressive. They're usually born normal, and then you have progressive hearing loss, and in my case, it goes from, you know, whatever it was. They did not test people when I was born, almost every single one of you probably had your hearing tested when you were born. Um, they did not do that when I was born, so that was a great law to pass. And we knew that I was speaking, but then, you know, somewhere it went out on there, and, you know, that's where it ended up. Other question? And I know from the earlier class, I will clarify, I have a hearing aid in my left ear, and when I was about 30, I got the cochlear implant in my right ear. And that combination works really well for me. Is that combination work for every student? I know students here have hearing loss and you see them and some of them have different combination. It's like individuality. It works for some people and doesn't work for others. In my case, the combination works. I didn't know you could combine those two, like both the cochlear. Charlotte has a, Sorry? Has a cochlear and the right. They, they didn't know that you could have a cochlear and a hearing aid. Yep, cochlear implant. Nice little magnet in my head. It's really cool if you want to put like safety pins, they stick to my head. And you'll ask like, what's the difference between a hearing aid and a cochlear implant? A hearing aid is simply an amplifier. So what happens if you turn the volume up in your car radio too much? So there's only so much you can amplify sound. So hearing aids usually work for people that have not quite as bad of a hearing loss. A cochlear implant is probably your worst hearing loss, and it actually bypasses um, the little, it goes into the spiral part of your ear where there's wires, and it directly stimulates the nerve. So it's giving you artificial hearing. You think of it as a piano instead of the full piano. I probably maybe have a third of the piano. So if you do it as a child, they don't notice the difference. As an adult, you can sometimes have adaptation challenges. So they're just two different technologies. I could probably have both, but I'm too chicken to do this year because I like the status quo. Thank All right. you.